Our next uh, presenter this afternoon is Associate Professor Mark Locks, who is the 2021 John Oxley Library Honorary Fellow. Mark is a researcher into organised crime in Australia. What a source of weekend barbecue conversation that must be. <laughs> The fellowship has provided him with the unique opportunity to explore the detail of the history of criminal groups in Australia. And Mark will use this information to bring to life through a narrative, history, visual maps and networks, and in podcast form. Given that it's crime, I'm sure it'll be incredibly popular. So please welcome Mark to the stage. Good morning. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I have been involved in looking at the Fitzgerald Inquiry for quite a long time. And it's been a part of my work life and it's a part of my research life. So I really, really appreciated the opportunity to get in to the library and look at the material there. So I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land as well. And I want to also acknowledge the completely under-researched history of the native peoples of this area and all of Queensland. But I also want to acknowledge the special place that the State Library holds in that research for everybody who does history research in Queensland. And I have loved my opportunity to be here with the people in the library who are quite frankly the biggest group of history nerds I have ever met in my life. It's been an absolute pleasure. Now, as a prequel to my presentation, I just want to give you a background one of my earliest jobs in the Queensland Public Service was as a researcher. It was one of my favourite jobs. I read 54 newspapers a day. This was before we had media monitors. So this was actually just after someone had been born um, <laughs> quite some time ago. And the way we actually tracked the, the media was by cassette tape. So one of my jobs as I'm reading these newspapers was I had to record the news as it came on every hour from the ABC. And this was during the Fitzgerald Inquiry. So the first break during the inquiry every day was for morning tea, and the 11 o'clock bulletin was the first news from the Fitzgerald Inquiry. And you know that theme song for the news, that da 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 my left hand still goes to hit record <laughs> when I hear it. And as a researcher, I had to brief people in government and this one day, I had to brief my first minister. His name was Don Lane, <laughs> right? I didn't sleep that night. I was terrified. Like, this was my first serious briefing that I had to give of anybody. And everyone knew I was really nervous. Anyhow, the briefing was at midday of that day. And I couldn't concentrate on the newspapers. And I'm sitting there going, oh, God, what am I going to do? I'm not going to remember anything. And at 11 o'clock... The music played, I hit record, and I heard, Don Lane has admitted to corruption. <laughs> <laughs> and my boss stuck a head around the corner and went, I think you're in the clear. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to uh, <laughs> finally get into my presentation, I was excited to actually get the opportunity to get into the closed collection of the Phil Dickey collection. Now, Phil Dickey was one of the people who really made the Fitzgerald Inquiry happen. He was one of the reporters, a very, very brave reporter, who was looking into the corruption happening in Queensland and letting all of us know. And one of the things I want everyone to remember about the Fitzgerald Inquiry is this isn't something that just happened in the past. It was something that was happening around all of us in Queensland at the time. So it was a very social thing. You know, um, my students don't quite understand what it was like to live during the 70s and 80s in Queensland, and they seem to think of organised crime as something that happens in the shadows, something that nobody saw. But my mother could tell you where the massage parlours were, because they were on main roads. They had big signs. The one at Gympie Road at Kedron had a red light in front of it, for Christ's sake. And who remembers Russ Hinn standing in front of Bubbles Bathhouse saying, there are no massage parlours up running in Queensland? <laughs> so it was something, and this is, this is where I come from, this is something that we all participated in in some way or another, either as um, people who saw it happening around them, people who were victims of it, or people who were customers of it. 
So my first research into this area in academia was I did my PhD on the history of public sector ethics legislation from 1859 to 2005 in Queensland. The most boring document you will ever read. I'm not going to read it again, and I don't suggest any of you read it either. But it got me, obviously, back into the Queensland um, police corruption and political corruption zone. And I started researching more into the Fitzgerald inquiry. And I'd been hunting around trying to get information. Because at the time, nothing had been really published. There'd been a few articles and things like that, and there were some things in the newspapers which were very difficult to get. And I'd been ringing people up, and no one was getting back to me. And out of the blue one day, a guy rang me from State Archives. He said, hey, um, are you the guy who's trying to get the transcripts of Fitzgerald Inquiry? I said, yeah, 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 that's me. OK, sent. I said, oh, well, do you want my postal address? No, I've emailed it to you. I said, oh, what? What do you mean you've emailed it to me? Yeah, there it is. You should see it on your screen now. There was a single Word document, 35,000 pages, 7.3 million words of the entire inquiry. <laughs> that started my research off really well. When I went into this collection, I really didn't know what I was going to find. And it was a serendipitous experience. What came out of it is three separate projects, and I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. One of them is an extension of work I've already done, and the other two are reasonably new. So the Fitzgerald Inquiry was about police corruption in the community. The community is a social network. Now, here's the map, the social network map from, I think this was the Telegraph, actually, at the time. And it sort of gives you some idea of the money moving around. What I did was I use actual um, programs where we can actually plot these things quite clearly. This was the SP Bookmaker Network handling money, so all those lines of flows of money, into the licensing branch in the 1950s and 60s, before Jack Herbert arrived. Okay, how old was this? This probably went back to 1860, for all we know. As, as one of the police who was interviewed in New South Wales during the Wood Inquiry said, they asked him, how long has police corruption been going on in Sydney? And he went, I don't know, first fleet. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we know this was going on in the 50s and 60s, but we just don't know if it was going on any early because no one has ever asked. Now, Jack Herbert arrived, and this is what, how it was happening. Note that you see the money coming through. He took over, and he's in the middle. Prior to that, all the police were collecting money locally, and Jack went, you know what, this isn't really efficient, and I don't have much power. So he knocked most of the police out of the network. There's only a handful left. Pr before he arrived, nearly everyone in the branch went out to their local SPs and collected money and brought it back to Jack, who then distributed it. When he took over, he took over. Cutting forward to the 70s, things happened, far too complex to discuss here. He left the police. He was pretty much forced out through embarrassment. Now, just to prove to two groups of my friends here that I can bring Star Wars into any conversation, <laughs> if you remember in the first movie, Obi-Wan Kenobi is fighting Darth Vader and he says, if you cut me down, I will become more powerful than you ever imagined. And he didn't. He did nothing. And he died. Not true for Jack. They cut him down and he left the police. Best thing that ever happened to him. Because there was no one watching the police being corrupt and no one watching the people outside the police. So here's a hierarchy with Jack, Terry Lewis on the side there, of him operating his network once he was outside. This isn't very clear. It's clearer here. <laughs> and you can see these upstairs. When I'm finished, this will be about 20% of the map. So it's extremely complex. What I'm producing is these maps to cover all of the people who participated. So has anyone read the Condon books? All of the people in the Condon books will be on the map and all the money will flow. So that's what I'm going to produce with a commentary. So the library will have this information. Okay? This is the social network of the corruption that was going on. Now, but there was more than this. It was a human story. These, this is, these lines are money. 
But these were people who knew each other. These were people who hung around together. These were people who had relationships with each other. And at the centre of those relationships, at the centre of what we call the criminal milieu, were the women. And I mean that literally. So Shirley Briffman, Anne-Marie Tilly, all through the transcripts, people are going, if you wanted something, you went to see one of these two people. In the 60s, it was Shirley. In the 70s and 80s, it was Anne-Marie Tilly. So you were going, oh, one of my friends has just been caught. I need to get to a police officer to find out who I can bribe. How am I going to find out how to do that? I'll go and see Shirley. She'll tell me. And she would. And she'd make a phone call. Likewise in Queensland. And when I say relationships, the police who were running the corruption were literally in relationships, romantic relationships, with these women. Now, let me say that these women were very cynical individuals. And there are questions like, Officer such and such was in love with you. Yeah, I, I think he said that. I don't think I ever said that. So they were very willing to allow these relationships to continue, often multiple officers at a time. But as you go further through it, in the Sunshine Coast, in the Gold Coast, the police who were investigating the women working in the massage paths and the escort agencies were often in relationships with those women. So this is a much more human uh, story than just money passing hands. But they held power. If you're in a network and you're in the centre of a network, you're what we call a broker. Brokers hold power because you can't get things done without them. In Shirley Briffman's case, unfortunately, that power was tremendous. And it is highly suspected that she was killed as a result of that. That is a different story that I will tell on top of the social network maps. Now, what I really found, though, was Phil Dickey has gone in, he's done all this work on the Fitzgerald Inquiry, he's bored with the Fitzgerald Inquiry. Now he's looking up what else is out there. What's the next organised crime that's going to hit Queensland? He looked at bikies. He looked at the Yakuza. But the main bulk of the data in there is about the Andrangheta, the Italian organised crime groups. Because there was a history going back to the 1920s in Australia of police being aware of this group. So we always talk about the Italian Mafia, people think it's Sicilian Mafia. The Sicilian Mafia in America, absolutely. In Australia, it was not. It was the Andrangheta. And you've all seen stories about the Griffith Mafia. And you've seen other stories about things happening in the Melbourne fruit markets. That's the extension of these groups and these families. The bulk of the data is about that, okay? That's a huge exercise. I had to narrow it down. So what I found was this concept called the Black Hand Society. In Queensland, we often talk about it in relation to the Italian community, but it wasn't. It was a generic concept. The Black Hand Society concept referred to any group that was terrorising or extorting the community. Right up until the 1960s in Hansard, politicians were accusing each other of being black handers in relation to how they were trying to extort policy or extort taxes or something like that. But the biggest story in Queensland about the Black Hand Society is what happened to the poor Italians moving to the region around Ingham and Innisfail and a group of people took advantage of this style of behaviour and were sending letters under the guise of the Black Hand to extort money out of the local community, and that community suffered murder, bombings, and all sorts of terror over a decade. Now, that story's been told in part, but what I'm doing is I'm going to greater detail. I've finished going through Trove, and I've just heard that Trove might be being closed down through government funding cuts. Really, does everyone know about Trove, the newspaper, online newspapers? I'm horrified at the thought of that disappearing. But the other thing I'm going through is I've been out to the state archives and I'm going to start going through the police records from the region through that period to get the extra detail. And that's another story that's really important to tell. That's the podcast part. That's the podcast outcome. So... My outcomes. I'm going to make all the maps available. 
one massive map, but then break it down by different types of behavior, different groups of people, different networks, what we call ego networks, like the one I showed you of Jack Herbert, is based upon what he knew. Maps of the key locations, we're going to map Queensland, map Brisbane, map the Gold Coast, and place where the escort agencies, where the sex shops, where the massage parlors, where the gambling places were. You may live in one. Does anyone live in Cairns Terrace in Red Hill? I won't give the number of the house out yet, but. <laughs> so we're going to put before and after photos. The, uh, the photo collections here are just incredible. Um, I'm going to be writing the history of the milieu in Brisbane and Sydney because Shirley Briffman worked in Brisbane and then had to run to Sydney where she became heavily involved in the police corruption there. The black hand will turn into a book and a podcast. Um, and obviously I have to write my academic papers because somebody wants to pay me and I want to get paid. So that's my university part. So I will wrap up there. Thank you very much again to the library for this opportunity. I'm, well, I'll probably be working on this till the day I retire and beyond that as well. Thank you again.